Wellington Mara's lifelong devotion to the game of football began when he was a young man, working as a training camp ball boy for his father's team, the New York Giants. After graduating from Fordham University in 1937, he started working for the Giants as a part-time assistant to the president. He also served as a scout or any other role he could fill. And in 1938, he began to work full-time with his father Tim and his brother Jack in the front office as club secretary. But on November 10, 1941, Wellington Mara showed his devotion to his country when he enlisted in the United States Navy. He was 25 years old. On January 28, 1942, he was assigned to active duty. After completing midshipman and flight director school, he was commissioned as a lieutenant on May 1, 1942. From October of 1944 until his honorable discharge in November of 1945, Lieutenant Mara served overseas in the South Pacific during World War II. He was one of nine naval radar officers aboard the aircraft carrier USS Randolph. During his tenure on the ship, Lieutenant Mara's frequent written correspondence with his parents, Tim and Lizette, and his brother Jack, provided insights and intimate details of his military experience. The letters also served as a critical lifeline between himself and his family back home in New York. In January of 1945, the USS Randolph set sail from Pearl Harbor and anchored 17 days later at Ulithia Toll, a tiny collection of islands in the Pacific Ocean, 1,300 miles south of Japan, and were waiting to receive orders for their first mission. Dear Jack, mail has been coming in pretty well, and I received about 10 letters yesterday. Now that everyone is back on board, we are reading the papers and getting a little impatient, believe it or not. I didn't think that I would be getting eager, but it looks as though I am. We have a great bunch, and I know we'll do okay. I find myself pretty much in the position of a playing coach. Practically all of our men are without previous experience, and they look up to us. I've had three years of getting ready for the big league, and as I said before, I'm getting eager. I think I can handle the job. Not worried about it anyway. We'll write again soon. Love to all. Well. In early February of 1945, Wellington Mara was on duty in the ship's combat information center when a fighter pilot who was returning from a reconnaissance mission crash-landed in the Pacific Ocean after his engine failed. Lieutenant Mara and one of his fellow radar officers directed the rescue operation. Dear Jack, it certainly is a big ocean, and I guess only an Irishman or a draftee would come this far for a fight. We had a little excitement the other day, had some fighters in the air about 55 miles from the ship, and one of them had to land in the water after his motor cut out. One of the pilots called in and said that the pilot was out of the wreck safely, but didn't have a life raft. We had a bomber near the ship, and we sent him out to drop the extra life raft they always carry to the pilot in the water. We directed him out until he could see the planes circling okay, and he dropped the raft to the pilot. He went into the water at 222. We had the raft out to him about 250, and he got aboard the destroyer at four o'clock. Nick and I handled the whole thing, and Nick smoked about a full pack of cigarettes. We felt pretty good about saving him, though, and the air officer was tickled to death, said we'd done a good job. Not much else to write about at the moment, so I'll close for now. We'll write again in a day or so. Love to all, well. On June 6, 1944, more than 160,000 Allied troops landed along a 50-mile stretch of heavily fortified French coastline to fight Nazi Germany on the beaches of Normandy in what is known as D-Day. But the invasion of Normandy was not the only D-Day of World War II. Every amphibious assault in the Pacific Theater had its own D-Day. In February of 1945, a 28-year-old radar officer, Lieutenant Wellington Mara, was aboard the aircraft carrier USS Randolph on just such a mission. 16 B-25 Mitchell bombers 
were sitting ready on the flight deck, poised for an airstrike on Tokyo. And on the eve of the attack, the young Lieutenant Mara penned this letter to his brother Jack. Dear Jack, it's D-Day minus one for us, and we are clinging tenaciously to the nicest bad weather you ever saw. If this were a Sunday in the fall, we'd say that it surely wasn't Mara weather. The clouds are low, and there are plenty of them, and they cover us like Livingston covered Hudson, like a blanket. Yesterday, the captain told the crew that we were in enemy waters. He said he was proud of the fact that we had reached the combat area so quickly, and that he thought we were ready. It's pretty near kickoff now, and the nerves are getting a little tense. Seems as though we could surely expect something, from a large-scale attack to a snooper or two. It all comes down to that old question, did they spot us? Tomorrow morning, we will know the answer. And if they didn't, it will be tough on them. If they did, it will be tough on us. But I hope it will be tough on them too. Love to all, well. The next day, February 16, 1945, the captain and crew of the USS Randolph made military history when they launched the first ever carrier-based attack against Tokyo. Over the next few days, bombers battered targets on the Japanese mainland, and the assault proved to be a major step towards an Allied victory in the South Pacific. News of the attacks made headlines back in the United States. And Jack Mara wrote to his brother, hoping to get more details about the mission. Dear Well, coincidence or not, we received your letters of February 2nd and 8th today and then read in the papers about the big raid that is being carried on against Tokyo. As Jack Pearl used to say, was you there, Charlie? We were all thrilled reading about the rescue of the pilot, and I expect that by the time May Thorpe gets through talking about it, you will have rescued the whole Pacific fleet and will be getting the Congressional Medal of Honor. Everything else is quiet. Love, Jack. Wellington's response was swift and comforting. Dear Jack, I can tell you what you most certainly guessed anyway, that we arrived here just in time to join the gang that hit Tokyo. There was quite a lot of team spirit in evidence all the way through, I thought. The pilots who weren't flying were all in the wardroom, where they got all the information about what the target was, the weather, etc., etc. When the time would come for them to take off, Pilots, man your plane. They would start to leave with all their flight clothes on, and the ones who were staying behind to go on later flights would all stand up and cheer and give them a big send off. Just like the substitutes giving the starting team a slap on the back as they left the locker room. We didn't have the supreme good luck of having the weather clear on the morning of the first attack though, and the bad weather hampered the attacks throughout our stay. However, you can't have everything. And the low-hanging clouds made our job, which is to defend the group from air attack, that much easier. It sure has helped out a lot so far. Love to all, well. Throughout his tour of duty overseas, Wellington received frequent updates from Jack about team business and also about other New York Giants who had been called into service. A number of players, such as Ward Cuff, Len Younts and Hank Soar were able to return to the playing field after completing their service. Others were not so fortunate. Jack Lummis, who played both offensive and defensive end, was killed in action in the battle for Iwo Jima. He received the Congressional Medal of Honor for his heroism and is one of only two NFL players ever to be bestowed with that distinction. And Al Blosis, one of the Giants' all-time greatest linemen who went missing in action and never returned home. Dear Well, I received a shock when I read yesterday's papers because Al Blosis is listed as missing in action somewhere in France. The last time he was heard of was on February 2nd. However, as I wrote his folks, there is a great expectation that he may turn up later on as a prisoner of war. 
When I was in Chicago, Bill Pascal called me up to state that he had been classified 1A. However, he is going to attend Purser School at the Merchant Marine for six months. He then will take a short sea trip, and if all goes well, he will be able to play next year. I saw an article in the paper that Flaherty has been discharged from his present duties and is going to the South Pacific. I am enclosing a clipping announcing the death of Alex Ketsko. He was with us a while two years ago. Under separate cover, I am sending you the draft lists and our active and reserve lists. I have already written to all of our old players and to as many of the boys on our draft list that I could locate reminding them that we will be very happy to have them with us when they get discharged. I will write again right after the league meeting and I will give you all the dope. Love, Jack. In his response, Wellington expressed sorrow for the loss of his fellow Giants and hope for the future of the team once the war was over. Dear Jack, surely sorry to hear about Blosus and I hope something will turn up on him. The ship's paper had a story about Pascal passing his pre-induction test the other day. There is a Dr. Robertson aboard here who comes from his hometown. Glad to hear that Pascal will be so near at hand. After what I saw last year, I think he is one of the best ever at carrying the ball anyway. Have been working over the draft lists lately and trying to see how things look for the future. Hope you will be able to get someone busy on starting to locate those boys so we can get after them. I believe the great majority of the boys are going to want to play again. Sure hope I can get back and get on the job again. I really am getting the fever. Guess that's all for now. We'll write again in a couple of days. Love to all, well. On the evening of March 11, 1945, the USS Randolph was at anchor in Ulithia Toll, while her crew was watching the movie A Song to Remember in the ship's hangar. At approximately 8.07 p.m., a twin-engine Japanese kamikaze plane carrying a 1,700-pound bomb crashed into the vessel, destroying 4,000 square feet of the flight deck. Fires, fed by ammunition, gasoline, and oxygen cylinders set the entire stern ablaze. But the men heroically fought the fire and saved the ship. Twenty-seven sailors were killed and 105 were injured. Damage this severe usually meant the repairs had to be made at a shipyard back in the United States. But the USS Randolph was not an ordinary ship. Repair crews sent from the USS Jason, immediately went to work with help from the Randolph sailors. 19 days later, the ship was once again ready for battle. The repair at sea was so exceptional that the USS Randolph became known as Randu Kandu. Shortly after the attack, Lieutenant Mara sought to reassure his family that the officers and crew on board the ship were bloodied, but unbowed. Dear folks, looks as though we'll get a rest for a while, which we don't need, but we'll take nevertheless. I know you all too well to tell you not to worry, because I know you would anyway. There is no denying that there is an element of danger in what goes on out here. Ships get hit sometimes and people get hurt, but the percentage is pretty small. And I don't know but that a fellow is better off in the midst of this bunch than ducking traffic in New York in peacetime. Being on a carrier with this gang is something like playing quarterback for the Bears used to be. If anyone or anything ever does get through to take a shot at you, he is beaten, bruised, and bloody. This outfit doesn't set out to do anything that it can't handle, and it can handle pretty nearly anything. I'll close now and try to get this into the mail. If you shouldn't hear from me for two weeks or so, don't worry. Love to all, well. On April 5, 1945, the USS Randolph steamed out of Ulithi to rejoin the fight against the Japanese in Okinawa. Over the next four and a half months, her bombers would battle enemy forces in Amami, Kyushu, Hokkaido, Tokyo, and the Philippines. On August 13th, 
Her fighter planes shot down the last two Japanese aircraft they were to destroy in the war. The following day, August 14th, the crew aboard the Randolph were anxiously awaiting confirmation that Japan had surrendered, while Lieutenant Mara tried to celebrate his 29th birthday. Dear folks, as usual, for the past several days anyway, I have one ear stuck in the radio listening to the Armed Forces radio station. As you can well imagine, these have been very hectic days for us, and one never knows just what to expect next. In the meantime, we continue to eat well. The food situation was pretty good for the birthday, too, as I had steak, which is no doubt better than you were able to have at home. Tonight on The Watch, we have my birthday cake to eat. These last three days have been the longest of the whole war, I think. As one of the fellows said, if they don't surrender soon, we'll have to. I can't stand the strain. Anyway, this surely has been quite a birthday. The next day, August 15th, Lieutenant Mara received the best belated birthday present he could have ever hoped for. When President Harry Truman announced that Japan had finally agreed to terms of full and unconditional surrender. I have received this afternoon a message from the Japanese government. I deem this reply a full acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration, which specifies the unconditional surrender of Japan. On September 2, 1945, aboard the USS Missouri, General Douglas MacArthur and Japanese Emperor Hirohito signed the Japanese Instrument of Surrender, marking the official end of World War II. Three days later, September 5, 1945, Captain J.R. Tate announced that the USS Randolph and its crew would finally be heading home. Dear folks, there really is much joy on board tonight. We got orders today to proceed to Pearl Harbor spend a week or two having some changes made, and then go through the canal. We believe that we have been assigned to the Atlantic Fleet and fully expect that Navy Day will find us at anchor in the Hudson River. Knowing how things happen though, there is always a good chance that orders will be changed. We'll surely let you know if anything happens. I've had a lot of experience with scuttlebutt, and it's just like getting tips at the racetrack. You have to know whom to listen to and whom to ignore. Anyway, that's the way it is. And until I hear differently, that's the way I think it's going to be. With love to all, it will be good to get home well. The USS Randolph returned to Norfolk, Virginia on October 15th. On November 2nd, 1945, after three years, nine months, and 26 days of service, Naval Radar Officer Lieutenant Wellington Mara received his honorable release to inactive duty. He returned home to work alongside his father Tim and his brother Jack to help run the family business, the New York Football Giants. And the rest, as they say, is history. <laughs>